Good morning. morning. Welcome this morning as we come together to worship. Um, It's been a while since I've been here, Uh, and so some of you may not recognize me. Uh, My name is Dan Brown. For 10 years, I was the pastor at John Calvin Church in Truro, and I bring you greetings from them. But for the past couple of years, I've been serving as your chaplain at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And so I bring you uh, greetings from Halifax as well. We come together this morning to worship, and as we do so, we begin with an opening song. We sing Our God. This morning, we come together to celebrate and remember Epiphany. Epiphany is the time in our calendar when we remember the story of the Magi, the wise men who traveled to find Jesus. And so we hear that story as our call to worship from Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. 
But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found, them, found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented with him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Let us prepare our hearts in a time of silent prayer. We'll follow that with Jesus' name above all names. As we gather here to worship, there is one truth that unites us and brings us here. It's that God is with us. He is with us in our lives, and he is with us in our worship. We are greeted together. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit and all God's people said. Amen. Let's take a moment, greet one another with the peace of Christ.
Shall we pray? O oh Lord our God, we come before you today to worship, to praise, to give thanks for what you have done for us. And as we come before you to worship, we realize that in the lives that we have lived, we have not lived up to your calling. We have sinned against you, against one another. But Lord, we pray. And this morning, as we pray, we come before you and we seek your grace. We confess our sins. We confess the things that we have done. We confess the things that we have left undone. And we lift before you the things in our lives that we don't recognize as sin, but are. We confess them all. And we seek your forgiveness, your healing, your reconciliation. So Lord, on this day, help us to know your son Jesus. Help us to know his death and resurrection. Help us to know that we have been forgiven and that life is there for us full and free. And so we can worship you with pure hearts. We lift our prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The scriptures tell us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us share in God's will for our lives as we look to his word and we'll read responsively. The word of God tells us this, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. In Christ we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. You shall not murder. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Those who have been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands, so that they may have something to share with those in need. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I have never to be content, whatever the circumstances. Let us sing together. Create in me a clean heart.
we pray. O Lord our God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for the blessing of forgiveness and the grace of knowing that we live in you. Now, Lord, as we continue our praise, we pray a special blessing upon our young ones, our young children from ages three up to grade five as they prepare to go for children's church. We pray that you would be with the leaders, that you would bless them and keep them and grant them your spirit. We pray that all our young ones would go, and this morning they would find Jesus. We ask that you would bless them in their learning and in their praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. To our young ones from age three to grade five, you are now, you are now blessed on your way to Children's Church. As the wise men did so many years ago, we come to bring worship and praise to our God with the gifts of our offerings. Our offerings are for the general fund, and the second offering is for the gems, and that says local, so I'm guessing for that, that's for the gems club here. So let us honor and praise God with these gifts.
Good morning. It's uh, nice to be away with family at Christmas, but I think the nicest thing about going away is coming home again. <laughs> Scripture this morning is taken from Romans, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 31 to 39. But before we get into that, uh, let us bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us as we read your word. Be with our pastor as he brings a message. Open our hearts. Help us to understand. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture will be found on page 1119. We start at verse 30, 31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us? How will we not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it was written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any power, neither height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So far the reading. Sisters and brothers in Christ, this morning I want to start with a question, and I'm going to ask the question, I just want you to hold on to it for a little while. The question is this, what is the most important thing that you have ever discovered in this universe? Hold on to that. Now, do you remember the ice bucket challenge? few people maybe. It wasn't too long ago, a couple years, 2014. Folks on the internet were using social media to post videos of themselves taking a container of ice, a, a bucket, some people used coolers, one person who was very industrious used like the loader for a tractor. And what they did is they filled it with, with water and with ice and they dumped it over their head. 
And when they were done, they'd go and they'd challenge three of their friends to do the same thing. Now, why would people do something so absolutely ridiculous? Well, they did it to raise awareness for, for funding for ALS research, Lou Gehrig's disease. And the challenge in 2014 was a very, very successful one. It raised over $115 million for research. Now, what happened to all that money? Well, 80 researchers took it in 11 countries, led by Dr. John Landers of the University of Massachusetts and Dr. Jan Veldink of the University Medical Center in Utrecht. And they were able to study a whole bunch of people who were struggling and suffering with such a horrible disease. And they were able to isolate the NEK1 gene that is a major factor in the development of the disease. This is a significant discovery that is going to allow them to develop treatments for ALS, such a horrible disease going forward. Scientists discover amazing things in this universe. They discover treatments for diseases. They examine the fundamental forces of our universe. They find technology to, to increase the productivity of our fields and our farms and our animals. They find ways to harness energy more efficiently and less destructively. Here's a question. What's the greatest, most significant discovery that scientists have made? Was it fire or the wheel? Indoor plumbing? Sewers and sanitation? Iron and steel? Electricity? Gravity? The atom? The stars? Insulin? Antibiotics? It's an interesting debate. If you sit with university students for a while, like I have the, the joy of being able to do. You hear this going back and forth, these conversations. What is the greatest discovery in science? What have they made? And they'll go back and forth for hours and hours trying to figure out which department has the most impressive scientist. What was the most significant event in history? What I'd like to do this morning is suggest that these are all great things. Science is cool. But the most significant discovery made by scientists was made by three scientists whose names we don't really know. Now, tradition has given them names. Today, we call them Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar, the wise men, the three kings, the magi. Today, we would call them scientists. The word used to describe them, magi, it finds its origin in Persia, Iran, and Iraq today. And that's the geography of the East that we're dealing with in the story of Epiphany. It's the root that we get the term magic from. But these weren't magicians as we might understand them today. They weren't wizards going around casting spells. They were scientists who would try to connect the workings of the world around them in ways that would allow them to predict the future. And good magi, good wise men, good scientists were incredibly valuable. They would measure the seasons, the passage of time, the amounts of rain that had fallen, the levels of the rivers and the streams, the position of the sun and the stars. And they would take all this information and they would gather it and they would compile it and they would write it down and keep records so that when the king came to them, they could say, it's time to plant or it's time to harvest. It's time to store. It's time to trade. We have too much. Were they looking at famine conditions or times of plenty? If we look at the story of Pharaoh and Joseph in Egypt, that's the position that these three magi from the East would have held in their day. And they were vital for the survival of early societies. In the worlds of kings and empires, the, the king who had the best magi would be one of the ones who would be most successful in the world of nations and kings. They were important. This is why they were allowed into Herod's court. It's why he sought their opinion and the information that they carried. It's why they weren't executed the moment they suggested that there was another king of the Jewish people besides Herod. They were government scientists, foreign dignitaries. They're on official business because they had made a discovery. There was a star that had risen in the sky, a star that a king was being born in Judea was what it indicated. Now, what does that look like to us? We don't know. 
We'd probably dismiss it as, as astrology today, the nonsense that we find in newspapers. But somewhere in their records and histories, their legends and data was gathered, and there was a prediction that if a particular star was rising in a particular way in the sky, there was a significant royal event happening for the Jewish people. But we don't have that backstory. We don't know how it worked, but we don't need to know their method that brought them there. Astrology isn't a real thing, and it would be dangerous for us to give that power in our lives. But their science of the day, however flawed it may be, put them in the right time and the right place for more discovery, for an epiphany. Now, let me be clear. I'm not trying to take the wonder out of the story, the miracle out of it. I, I believe that God in his eternal providence guided the sun and the moon and the stars in their courses, knowing that three Persian magi would look up and then go. But what we do need to know from this story is that these weren't odd people. These were serious people, scientists in the highest level of government. This isn't the story of some wandering mystics just ending up somewhere. These are some of the world's best and brightest being led to a house in Bethlehem. Now, what is it that they expected to find when they got there? Well, the Magi expected to find a child, a baby, a new king, perhaps even a great king. And they came prepared with gifts for royalty. And likely they did this on behalf of the country they represented in order to honor the next leader and establish diplomatic relation and curry favor with the next regime. But when Herod heard what they came to do and what they were about, he got worried. And the text tells us that all of Jerusalem was worried with him. Now, my thought on this particular part of the text was that this was about the power dynamic in Jerusalem when we hear all of Jerusalem, the politics of the day, the people who were in power were worried about the destabilizing effects of a change in government, the prospects of a civil war. Because when the Magi gave their greeting to the court of Herod, there was a sense that something was going on. And there was a rumbling that the scientists, they didn't know about, but it started to bubble up that this wasn't just another king if everything was looking the way it was looking. This wasn't just about a rebel usurper to the throne. So they started to ask, and Herod asked, which star? Where is it in the sky? What town is it over? Bethlehem? Could, could this be Messiah? The Magi weren't the only ones interested in prophecy. The chief priests and the teachers of the law, they had some of their own. And Herod went to them because he was worried. And he asked, and, and they quoted him, Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd over my people, Israel. All of Israel, the regime, was worried. Herod was putting it together. These scientists and their stars, the religious authorities and the prophecies and the scriptures. He was worried because God might be up to something here. And that's why he sends these wise men on a bit of a spying mission. Herod likes his position of power. He likes the life that he's living. Messiah means that all of that is going to change. So what does Herod have in mind? Probably something along the lines of, I've got to stop this. Tell me where he is so that I can go and worship him. Probably not what he was going to do. But the scientists, the magi, the wise men, they go. They go chasing their star. And they go because they've learned more along the way. When they were in the court, they probably heard all this discussion going on, heard about the prophecy of Bethlehem. So they have this added to their knowledge, and they follow the star. And what they find out is this isn't just about nations and kings and diplomacy. There's something fundamentally bigger going on here, because the star leads them to a place, and to a place connected with a text, a text that tells them God is up to something. They left the east in search of another king. They arrived in Bethlehem, and the star led them there. It stopped above the house, and they were overjoyed because they discovered something. Now, what did they discover? They discovered that we are not alone. It's interesting. Scientific discovery, it's often accidental, unexpected, unplanned. 
maybe you're going in a direction and it leads you somewhere and you're not expecting to get there. These scientists were like that. They went looking for a star. They found a couple of texts. And then when they arrived in that house, everything is made clear in a moment of epiphany. When they started, they were probably figuring out, well, how do we plant the next crop and when should we do it? And at the end of it, what they find is God at work. They make their way to Bethlehem, into the house, and they make the greatest discovery of all. They find Jesus. They bowed down to him. And they worshipped him. Because their science and the scriptures, the two books that God uses to reveal himself, we would say in Reformed circles today, led them to one of the greatest epiphanies, one of the greatest discoveries in all of history. Emmanuel, God is with us. My friends, that discovery has ramifications, real world application, if you will. We could end with the dream that they had, with the Magi going home by another route. Uh, we could end with the reality that God is up to something in this world and ain't nobody going to stop it from, from happening, not even Herod. And that's what we hear from Paul in Romans. And that's important for us to know. The implications of this story are found contained in the wonderful words that many of us have heard many times. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, and certainly not Herod, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's the discovery that they made. And we could stop there and say, hallelujah, praise God, here is Jesus. But we need to know that Epiphany is about more than understanding what the Magi discovered. It's about looking to their story and then reflecting on our own, bringing it into our time and asking, what is the most important discovery that we have made about this universe? And the question, that we have for our head is this. Is it Jesus? Have we found Jesus? Have we discovered him? And so what I'd like us to do in this week as we think upon epiph Epiphany with our heads is to think about the time when we may have discovered him. Now maybe it was early on in our lives, sitting around the table with family as we, we share the stories again and again, year over year, telling us of the child who was born, the child who would grow up, the child who would die and rise for us. Maybe it was in church, hearing the preacher preach, saying, here is the Son, the Messiah, God who is with us. Maybe it was in young people's or gems, or, or maybe it's in children's church, where we find Jesus, hear that story, where, where we connect to it and realize this is the most important thing in the entire universe. Maybe it's in times of trouble when we needed something to lean on really, really badly and we found God was there. Christ was with us. Or maybe we haven't found him yet. We've heard, we know, but we haven't discovered him. Maybe this morning is a time when we can hear this story and know and realize that all of creation and the book of Scripture testifies together of this child dying and rising for you. God is with us. God is up to something. God is up to something for you. His love. His love that is so powerful that nothing in the whole of this universe can separate you from it. That's the head. The heart is this. We can think about it, know about that time, but often we don't connect our faith with that discovery. We live our lives separate from, from where we may have found it. And what I'd encourage you this week to do is to, to reconnect with that greatest discovery, to understand that as we live and as we breathe and as we move, this is the most important discovery in all of history. Jesus, this child who would grow up to die and rise for us, God with us, God's love at work is the most important thing. We get distracted. 
Our lives are often filled with things that pull us away, things that are interesting, things that are good, things that are cool, things that are big, things that are small and unworthy as well. But this is the most important thing, Jesus in our lives. This week, as we reflect on our story, our discovery, it's connected with our hearts, with our faith, remembering once again that, that Jesus is the most important thing. Our head, our heart, our hands. If it's the most important thing, then how does that impact the way we live, the things that we do, the things that we make? We come into our services and we come and we confess. The reason we confess is because the head, the heart, don't always get to the hands we forget, we don't do. How this week will that greatest discovery, the most important thing in all the universe, influence the things that you do, the way you live your lives, the way you honor and worship God who is with us? Head, heart, hands, and feet. How will you go to go into this world? Will you go back into the courts of Herod? Or will you go another way, finding a way to share that story, that discovery, and to help to bring people along the way, walking with them and allowing them to find the journey? Will you be that star that brings people to Jesus? Head, heart, hands and feet. The greatest discovery in this world leads them all and guides them all. Knowing that Jesus, God with us, came. Demonstrating the greatest love that we could ever know. Love that has no bounds and love that has no foe that can conquer. God's love that reminds us we can never be separated from him in life, in death, and forevermore. This is the greatest discovery that we know in Jesus Christ our Lord. Shall we pray? Oh Lord, our God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for Epiphany, that your light shines on us, that we have this great discovery, the greatest discovery in all of time and space, the discovery that you, O oh Lord, are with us and that we are not alone. That though we sin and we fall, you entered this world in the person of Jesus Christ. Divine and human. Emmanuel, God with us. So that we would know that we are loved. That we would know that we are blessed. That we would know that we are forgiven and given life that is full and free and forever. Our Lord and God, in this week, we pray that you would help us to know with our heads, to remember that time when we met Jesus, when we discovered him. And if we haven't discovered him, Lord, we pray, we pray that you would help us to find him in this season of Epiphany. We pray that this would be the time that we would know him fully. And we pray that that story, that time of discovery, would be more than an intellectual remembrance, but that it would go to the heart of our being. That it would inspire our faith. That it would give us comfort and joy. And that it would be the most important thing for us. And we pray that our hearts would inspire our hands to live and serve and worship you. Wherever we go this day and for the rest of this week and for the rest of our lives, help us to dedicate ourselves to you. Help us to live lives according to your glory and your purpose for us. And Lord, send us on our feet. Send us on our feet by another way, not by the ways of kings and economies, but your way, a way of miracles, a way of grace, a way of mission. Bring us to places where others will not tread and help us to find the lost and bring them back to you so that they may discover what we already know and believe and live. Your son Jesus, the most important thing in time and space. Lord, we lift our hearts to you. Guide our lives, we pray, in his name, in Jesus' name. 
。阿门。Let us prepare ourselves for the way. We sing, be still for the presence of the Lord. Who's going to share with us a bit about C to C? Good morning to all of you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about C to C 2017. And I will give a little bit of history of the C2Cs before that. In 2005, there was the first C2C, and that happened、um, in that summer, and that was a kind of a celebration for a hundred year CSC Canada. And about 200 people biked from Vancouver to Halifax, and it took about nine weeks. And I and Henny, or Henny and me, were able to be.、Uh, Biking and volunteering on that、uh, on that journey there, and the most memorable thing about that biking tour that was、uh, the celebration in Guelph. We were in a big stadium, like from the Guelph storm, and there was about seven or eight hundred people, eight seven eight thousand people from the Christian Reformed Church who were there celebrating. And it was a, a, an unbelievable、uh, experience, and I still remember that. In 2008, there was another C to C, and it was in the United States. And Renata was a volunteer there, and she had quite an experience too, and I think she liked it too. Then in 2013, there was the next one in the United States, in the South, and、uh, Henny and I were both able to bike that from from.、Um, 
from California to New York for nine weeks. And again, there was, uh, that one, the, the cause was fight against poverty. Now this one, this year there will be another one, and it will be the 2017 C2C fight against poverty. It will start again somewhere by Vancouver uh, at the end of June, and it will go to Halifax again for about nine weeks. Now today I'm standing here not to raise funds yet, that will come later, but today I'm asking for volunteers who are planning either to be a, volunteers, a volunteer and helping out with the tour, or a rider, or riders. So if there are young, younger people or older people, maybe you can bike for a week, maybe for two weeks. And um, this is kind of the, uh, the idea that, that some people from our church uh, will participate in that. Now, uh, Henny and I, most likely, if Henny is feeling well and can bike again, will take part in this one. But uh, it is not something that we will do the whole tour. So most likely we will do a week here or two weeks there. We haven't decided yet how it will go. But we, our idea is that there are some people from our church who are going to participate. So after the church service, um, if anybody wants to have any information about what is, what is involved and all of that, then uh, people or volunteers can ask us. Thank you very much. I have a couple of announcements as well. Uh, the first announcement is that we do plan to have a brief congregational meeting after the service to approve our 2017 budget. So we would ask that the, any members here uh, stay after the service for a few minutes for that meeting. And the Sunday school children, I think, hope it's all right that they can go to their classrooms. And anybody else are free to get started on the coffee and tea without us, and hopefully we'll just be a few minutes behind you. And the second item is an update on our uh, budget from last year, or our offerings and, our, and fulfilling our budget from last year. I guess I would have been up here a few weeks before Christmas uh, with uh, telling you about the status of where we were then and then we were, uh, we were a fair bit behind in our budget at that time. So I guess I have some good news, some bad news, and some good news to share with you this morning. I guess the good news is that we were able to gain a fair bit of ground on our, on our offerings at that time. I think we were over thirty dollars or $35,000 behind on our budget in November. So the good news is that we were able to make up a fair bit of ground, and I think we finished the year off maybe only being $17,000 behind on our offerings. But, and the good news is that, um, so I guess that is the, uh, it's simply bad news and good news, no. <laughs> good news and bad news and good news, but the bad news is we were still, uh, we still were sixteen or $17,000 behind on our offerings, but the good news is, is that with some other miscellaneous uh, money that came in, and with our expenses in pretty much every category being under budget, we, uh, we're still able to finish the year, looks like two or $3,000 ahead. So being able to meet all of our, uh, all of our classical and, and uh, commitments and all of our, and still be able to make the payment on our loan. So we, with pretty much every category from, uh, from furnace heating oil to a lot of the, the ministries in the church not using their full budget and with our the ministerial expenses being lower, and I guess we didn't end up using, we had budgeted a, a few thousand dollars to finish off the, uh, on the, for the renewal lab program that we didn't use at the end of the year. So that is the, that's good, that's positive, and we're certainly thankful to God for, for, uh, for that news and for all of you to be able to contribute to help us meet that. And as I mentioned, we will meet for a few minutes after the service to approve next year's budget. And again, thanks for Dan Brown for coming here today to lead us in, in worship. We certainly appreciate it. And Dan is going to lead us in congregational prayer now. Shall we pray? Oh, well, Lord, our God, we thank you that you are with us, that you are with us in good news and in bad news, and that you are with us because of the great news that Jesus died and rose for us, that you are with us always. And this is the confidence 
and the comfort and the trust that inspires our prayer as we lift our hearts together, as we come before you and we bear before you the needs of our lives, our joys, our concerns, those among us who have need, those in whom we trust you to provide. And so, Lord, hear our prayers this morning and bless us by the power of your answer and the grace of your Son and in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Our Lord and God, this morning as we pray, we pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those who are in need. We pray for those who are recovering. We pray for those who struggle with illness. We know ultimately that it is your hand that heals and blesses and comforts and keeps and lifts and upholds for all of time. And so, Lord, hear us as we pray for those who are in need, those among us whom we love and care about. We pray for Dick and we ask that you would be with him as he injured himself, stepped on a nail on a, on a DRS mission. And that healing from the injury is complicated by, by other factors and the healing is going slowly for his foot. Lord, we pray that you would quicken the pace, that you would comfort his heart, that you would bless those who care for him and those who worry for him. And Lord, we pray that you would restore him well and that in all things he would know that you are with him. Lord, we pray for, for Bob as he continues to recovery for surgery on his eye. We pray that it would go well. We know that it will be a long journey for him, that full sight will take time. We pray that there would be no complications. We pray that he would heal well. We know, O oh Lord, that you are the God who restores our sight on what is important and on what is beautiful. And Lord, we pray that you would be with him as he journeys towards sight and seeing. We pray for David who has had his hip replaced. We pray that that would bring to him mobility and fullness of function, freedom from pain, blessing in his life. We pray that it would go well for him, that the recovery would be, would be quick and it would be a blessing to him. And we pray for Marnik who who broke his arm. And we ask that you would give to him healing and freedom from pain. We ask that you would bless him with mobility and, and no complications. We give thanks for, for youth and their exuberance and their energy and, and their freedom from fear. But Lord, when they, when they fall, we pray that you would help them to know that you, O oh God, are the one who picks them up and lifts them up for all of time. Our Lord and God, as we pray, we pray also for your church. We give you thanks for one another. We give you the thanks for being your people called together, brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we ask that you would be here in this place, in this community. That you would allow us the blessing of your spirit and your word as we minister to one another and to this community that is around. We pray that you would give to us the things that we need. Your word, your spirit, your peace, your unity. We ask that you would bless us as we seek to honor you. And Lord, we ask that you would be with us as, as there is a meeting in a few moments. As we discuss the budget for the coming year. Lord, we pray that you would give to us peace, that you would help us to, to make a promise together to serve you, that you would give to us serious, worshipful hearts as we consider the work of this church as you have placed us here, and that you would help us to look forward to your ministry, and that we would plan to give our gifts well, that we would take serious our covenant together, that you would inspire us to worship in the tradition that was given to us so long ago. And Lord, as we pray for your church, we give you thanks for our brothers and sisters from afar. We pray for students as they return to school, as semesters begin and the workloads begin anew. Lord, we pray that you would give to our students freedom and peace from, from the burdens and stresses. But Lord, we pray that you would help them to stress in appropriate ways because studies are hard. 
And being away from family is difficult. But Lord, you are molding and shaping them for the journey. So Lord, we pray that you would help them to discover you in all the things that they learn. Lord, we also pray for our brothers and sisters. This week we pray for, for the church in Charlottetown. We pray for them as, as they too are in a time of transition. And they are seeking new leadership. We thank you for the gifts that they have with them now. And Lord, we ask that you would help them to discern, discern well your call for them. And that for them you would raise the leaders that they need. And that you would bless them as they serve as we serve in your kingdom and in your grace. We pray that through them, Jesus would be known, discovered, and that through him, this world would be saved. Our Lord and God, we pray that you would bless us and keep us now. We ask that you would help us to remember, that you would help us to love, that you would help us to live, you would help us to serve. We pray these things in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing together, standing as we sing our doxology, Angels from the Realms of Glory. prepare to go into this day and into our lives, let us take a moment and prepare ourselves. Words like congregational meeting can sound like something that is different, but truly it is the same. It is an act of worship and gratitude that we give. And so as we go, let us prepare our hearts to do just that. And as we go, we receive his blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and grant you his peace. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>